Hi, everyone. I'm Dan Jones. Welcome to Interchange. Thank you so very much for joining us. Boy, it has been an interesting week. We'll touch on some of the highlights. If you shoot and kill somebody who breaks into your house, should the courts be forced to stand firmly behind you? We'll also talk about the all-night legislative sessions where there were screaming and arguing about whether or not the college scholarship process should be colorblind. And we'll wonder whether Milwaukee would ever support a UWM college football team. All right, let me introduce everybody. Once again, we have newspaper columnist Joel McNally. Kevin Fisher, longtime broadcaster, political analyst, and oftentimes a fill-in host over on WISN Talk Radio. Denise Calloway. Denise is the coordinator of business and community partnerships for the Milwaukee Public School System. And Gerard Randall, education consultant and local job creation expert. Rick Horowitz will be along with commentary at the end of the show. All right, the first thing we're going to talk about are the changes to the so-called Castle Law passed by legislators. It basically says courts will be expected to give you the benefit of the doubt if you shoot and kill somebody who breaks into your house. You don't have to know that they have a weapon or you don't have to prove that they were going to kill you. I think this would make a burglar think twice about breaking and entering, but I saw one editorial in the Journal Sentinel that was against the law. It said, a burglar, Kevin, doesn't deserve a death sentence. Well, the Journal Sentinel doesn't think that serial murderers deserve the death sentence, so I'm not surprised. But burglars do? Well, I believe the scales of justice, unlike you, Joel, who, you know, you, you embrace criminals and want to pin medals on their chest. I think the scales of justice are fine when they're tipped in, in the balance of the innocent person in, in his or her own home, as opposed to the perp who invades that privacy. Now, there isn't a DA in the country, I believe, that would take someone to court and prosecute them for defending themselves in their own home. That's right. Uh, but so why do you need to have well, the then there, but there's, to murder But there's them. the the, uh, the whole issue of civil litigation. And this prevents the innocent person, the law-abiding citizen, in, his, in the privacy of his or her own home, being victimized by a person who's invading the home that shouldn't be there in the first place. For heaven's sakes, you shouldn't have to uh, th think two, three, four, five times if someone breaks into your home and, uh, you, well, maybe you should have tried to escape. All right, maybe run out the back door. You don't know what's lurking outside the back door. You should be able, into a, in, in a country that has Second Amendment constitutional rights, the, the ability to defend yourselves and your loved ones. And the, 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 the burglar, the invader, shouldn't even be in your house in the first place. Denise, if it's 2 o'clock in the morning and you hear somebody downstairs, I can't for a second imagine that you wouldn't want to shoot them. Well, I mean, the first thing I would do if I heard somebody in my house at 2 o'clock in the morning is call the police. Um, you know, because I don't know what that person may or may not have, if they're armed or they're not armed, and there's more than one of them, where else people might be in the house. So, I mean, the, my, my first thing to do to figure out the best way to protect myself is to call the police. I mean, that's the first thing. But, you know, this, it, this, this bill is not necessary. As, as our DA in Milwaukee County, John Chisholm, said very rightly recently, there is already a law on the books that provides that kind of protection. What this does is to expand that in ways that, quite frankly, have the potential of threatening personal safety much more than protecting it. Because it's not just your house where you can decide you want to shoot somebody if you feel like you're threatened. It's your business. It's your car. It's your vehicle. Um, you know, nobody wants their car stolen. But if, if you're concerned that you think somebody might want to harm your car or harm you in your car, that you should be able to shoot them? I mean, that it doesn't make any sense at all. I think what it, it, it does is it plays, it's not necessary, and it plays on the worst fears that we have. If we think somebody might want to do something to us, it's okay to take them out. It's okay to potentially kill someone, to use deadly force, if we think someone might be ready to harm us. You know, I don't want anybody breaking into my house, um, but I have, I have difficulty thinking of a physical possession that I have that is worth another human being's life. Well, here's the thing. The, the vast majority of law-abiding people who will have guns in their homes for protection uh, take that responsibility very, very seriously. And they realize the risk involved. And they don't 
go off shooting willy-nilly. The vast majority of gun <laughs> crimes in America are committed by criminals who got their weapons illegally. It's a, it's a rather ridiculous assumption to make that if somebody has a gun in their home, that just because someone rings the doorbell or walks up the driveway, that they're going to automatically pull that we weapon and fire. But, but here's the problem. The law gives them a, the ability to do that and for the courts to be on their side. People, you don't have to you don't have to prove anything. You just have to say, I feel like, I think. And here here's what's ridiculous. That doorbell rings at two o'clock in the morning and it wakes me from a dead sleep. Uh, I'm not gonna be as aware, as conscious as I am right now. The chances of me making a bad decision about who I think is in my house at two o'clock in the morning are phenomenal. It might be a burglar, but you know what it might also be? It might be my 17-year-old kid who's sneaking in after curfew. Many people who, who support concealed carry say it is going to lead to fewer people coming up to you on the street and trying to rob you because they think they might get shot. Many people who support this law also believe that it's going to lead to fewer burglars because the burglar is going to think, huh, maybe I'll get shot, so I'm not going to go into this I, house. I, I, I would like to respond to the, the personal insult uh, from Kevin, and he's done it before. On this show, he's accused me of, of loving criminals. He's accused, accused me of loving child molesters. He's accused me of loving all sorts of despicable people. Being sympathetic, uh, not loving. Uh, oh, pin a, pin a medal on them, I believe, is the word you used. I have, I've been a victim of burglaries. I've been a victim of gun crime. I know that, Joel. Uh, and uh, I do not support criminals, and I never have. That's got nothing to do with this subject. This subject is whether you support murder or not. And what, for someone who claims to be pro-life, it, it amazes me that anyone could say it would be all right to murder a, a, a child, a, a teenager who breaks into your home, uh, someone you think you know, might be causing you some harm, even if they're unarmed. It's okay to murder unarmed people. Uh, you know, I, I can't imagine how that gets to be a pro-life position. And when, you know, when the Republicans said that in this you know, session of the legislature, they were going to concentrate on jobs. I didn't know it was going to be undertaker jobs. Uh, so far, that's all they've done is talk about murdering people, shooting people, uh, putting more guns on the street, putting more guns in our public places. Uh, you know, uh, it, it, is, it is not a decent society where we all have guns on our hips and are ready to kill each other. And, and that's what these people are advocating. Uh, the district attorney said it very well. The law says if, if you're defending yourself, we're not going to prosecute you. Judges aren't going to convict you. Juries are not going to convict you. You don't need to pass this law to encourage more murder. Uh, it is simply, you know, a... a a solution without any problem. You, at one o'clock in the morning, you hear your, your window break. Should you have the right to go down if you're afraid? And kill well, somebody. Well, there, there were two aspects to this. And, and I, too, have been <clears throat> a victim of, of uh, crime in my home uh, at gunpoint. Um, I can't imagine a scenario where when you're confronted with that, that you think rationally. I wasn't thinking rationally at the time. Fortunately, I didn't do anything that was stupid that would have led to anyone losing their life, let alone me. Uh, but the one, the one aspect on the criminal side is, can it be an effective deterrent? I don't know. On the other side, can it be uh, a deterrent to those who have committed crimes while in others' homes, and then they turn around and want to sue the homeowner for uh, some aspect of their crime that went awry, and that's the more likely scenario where this law will have some effectiveness, and that's the piece that I would support. All right, next topic. How about all the arguing over a proposal to make sure college grants and scholarships go to disadvantaged students regardless of the color of their skin? The version that passed the state assembly said, you just have to be poor. You don't have to be black, Hispanic, or Hmong. You just have to be poor. Critics say even the suggestion is racist. Turns out the state agency handing out these grants hasn't used race as a consideration for more than a year now after it received a warning from the federal government that it should not be used, Joel. Yeah, well, I'm not real impressed that the, the George Bush's Justice Department told uh, the state that. 
those these scholarships, uh, you know, the the TIP grants were created to try to encourage more minority participation in higher education of, of talented young people, talented African American, Latino, minority young people. Uh, everyone in this state knows how unbalanced our college populations are. Uh, on, on the Madison campus, 2.5% uh, African American students. On the, on the Milwaukee campus, it's only 6%. Uh, and, uh, you know, that means our college campuses are, in Madison, 98% white in in Milwaukee 94% white isn't that enough uh, don't you know the reason for this program was to you know help minority students uh, there are other scholarships for for white students in need there are plenty of scholarships based on need uh, and you know I, I went to college on a scholarship based on need uh, those scholarships exist uh, but the fact that this program also existed to encourage more diversity on our college campuses was a good thing not a bad thing and the fact that it was brought up again in this legislative session it was supposed to co concentrate on jobs instead let's let's you know have a big inflammatory racial discussion about you know whether we want to have scholarships uh, go to african american students uh, you know it it is just it is just mind boggling the way this legislature is concentrated on ugly, ugly issues uh, instead of jobs, which is what they claimed they were going to be talking about. So, Denise, is, is it fair to tell uh, a poor applicant to the UW system, sorry, you're white, you don't qualify for this, this grant, but the black kid there does, the Hispanic kid does, the Hmong kid does, but you don't, even though you're just as poor as they are? I don't know. Is it is it fair that one out of every two African-American children in this community depend on badger care to get their health care? Is it fair that the highest concentrations of poverty in this community are in African American, Latino, and Hmong communities? I don't think that's fair, but we don't seem to be nearly as upset, or at least the legislature doesn't, about addressing those kind of issues as it does about addressing this. The reality of it is these grants are set aside to help level a playing field that when you take a look at those figures, and unfortunately so many more that I just named, show the kind of position that students of color are in when they enter um, when they try to attend college, they're economically disadvantaged. Um, in many cases, they're living in poverty, so their parents don't have the ability to help them. So what this tries to do is level the playing field, so hopefully one day we can get to a point where you don't need to have um, scholarships or grant assistance that's based on race or socioeconomics or, or other factors because you've been able to build enough wealth by helping people get an education that helps to provide better jobs so these are not issues. This legislative session, I think, has in some ways just been kind of mean. You know, it's, it's, as it's, it goes back to something that really troubles me about our country where we seem to be in this position where if somebody, I think, has something that I don't have, and I, it's not necessarily that I want it, I just don't want them to have it. If I think I need to be afraid of somebody for whatever reason, I need to be able to protect myself at all cost. We are headed in a direction. You know, I, I can't help but think that the, the founders of this state, the signers of the, of the Constitution, of, of Wisconsin's Constitution, never ever imagined that when they developed the motto of forward, that this is how we would envision forward in 2011. Let's take kids who are already disadvantaged, who we know we want to be able to build our economy by creating more people with college, with college degrees. My gosh, you know, the Greater Milwaukee uh, Committee and, and dozens of other groups are engaged in this talent dividend uh, competition to raise the number of graduates in the metropolitan area by 1%. So let's, let's take something that might be helpful and say we don't want to do it. Is, I mean, is it's the, crazy. Is the proposal to make this colorblind, is that racist and bigoted or is it fair? I don't know what the motivation was that led to uh, this thing surfacing as it did. Uh, there are a number of concerns that I have. My first disclaimer is that I served on the Higher Education AIDS Board for several years. Um, and, and this issue was one that would come up perennially. Uh, whether or not uh, there were um, going to be challenges to uh, including in the uh, determination of who should have access to those scholarships, minority students. 
and year after year that was upheld. I think that when the challenge came from the federal government, as Joel had pointed out, in 2006, my disappointment was that the state government under Governor Doyle didn't issue a stronger challenge to the federal government uh, that would have <clears throat> led to the, the administration of those funds continuing to include in the mix minority students as minority students specifically named. That being said, you go back to Representative Krusik bringing it up, clearly there wasn't a whole lot of understanding of what uh, was going on in practice over at the Higher Education AIDS Board. Otherwise, I don't think she should have brought it up uh, or she would have had a lot of credibility when she brought it up, had that been widely understood that that, in fact, was the practice. To have it encoded in law makes absolutely no sense. That's one of those areas where the, if you want to take more and more and more flexibility away, you end up including fewer and fewer <coughs> students, especially those students who are most in need of getting the funds. So, and it makes people look just like what some folk may perceive them to be, and that's racist uh, for having brought it up. Uh, you can have your own opinions about how you think the money should be distributed, uh, and who will benefit most from it. I happen to think that it should include students of color specifically named to receive those funds. And I also think that there's a great benefit to the state in doing that. Clearly, that wasn't the, the, uh, the way things landed when they passed it. I'm actually thankful that the Senate won't have an opportunity to move forward on it. Kevin, the Democrats were so upset with Peggy Krusik that some of them said she should be kicked out of the party. Well, you know, I, I, on the merits, I think she was right. Uh, I think these grants and awards and scholarships should be colorblind. Uh, discrimination is blatantly wrong. So is reverse discrimination. But as a legislative aide for 15 years up there, mm -hmm. I'm perplexed as to what happened here. Uh, this came out of the blue. It came from a Democrat. It did not come from a Republican, and it, it, it took everybody by surprise. It caused a rift. They got off track. They got off message. They debated for nine hours. And now you do have uh, Democrats, or at least one, calling for uh, Peggy Krusik to be out of the Democratic caucus. That, that's not going to happen. That doesn't get you anywhere. How did we get to this point? I don't know for sure. My guess is that a concerned, angry, frustrated constituent of Representative Krusik's got to her, said, do something about this. She came late in the game with the bill at the end of the session when tensions are very high and everybody's trying to get their bills passed and get out of Dodge. Uh, did she not do her homework? Did a staff member not do her? their homework that Clearly, look, you know. that this is this is not an issue anymore or was she concerned that it could be a future issue i don't know but they certainly wasted a lot of time it, on it came from a democrat but it was supported unanimously by the republicans I, well there I, were some I, democrats I, that I'll point this supported out too. too it may be that that there were more political motivations in this around election politics. Peggy Krusik is from a South Side district that is increasingly conservative. There are heads up matches in, uh, to the southern end of her, I mean, to the eastern end of her district. She represents a good chunk of the Southwest. To the eastern end, you've got um, a matchup between two incumbents that um, have records that are moderate to liberal. Uh, you, you know, and her district, I think, uh, is the one that will probably be the most solidly conservative. It wouldn't surprise me if she moved to the Republican caucus. Kevin, Kevin is right. It would be great if these scholarships were colorblind. But the, the reality, the problem with it, is that we do not live in a society that's colorblind. So as soon as we get to that point where we live in a society that's colorblind, I don't think we'll have a problem with scholarships being the same. All right, shifting gears. The UW-Milwaukee is studying the possibility of starting up a football team. A lot of questions come immediately to mind. <laughs> How much would it cost? Who would pay for it? Where would they play? 
could they attract good players? Oh and would Milwaukee provide a, a decent <laughs> fan base? And Joel's thinking, and would they have to take my house to build a stadium? <laughs> <laughs> Every time there's a new athletic director at, at UWM, and, and they tend to be a lot of them, <laughs> it seems, because uh, there's a lot of turnover, uh, they have to come up with some new idea. Uh, but the weird thing is this idea is so far in the future, it's really not even worth discussing. Uh, the next thing that clearly, uh, athletically, they want to do on that campus, and the, and the new chancellor, Mike Lovell, has said he, he wants to bring you know, a lot of students on campus and create more of a campus atmosphere and the first step in that direction athletically is to build a, a stadium on the grounds for the basketball team mm -hmm. uh, and and that will be the next big project uh, uh, <laughs> it, it'll be 40 years before they consider anything like this. Would Milwaukee ever support a UWM football team? Yes, I have on my black and gold today. As a matter of fact. <laughs> oh. um, I, I, I know a shameless oh. advocate for it. Uh, several years back, there were a group of us, in fact, that investigated the possibility of bringing football back. Um, it's easier than, than, than what many may think. We looked at uh, utilizing the State Fair Park grounds. Uh, they could erect temporary seating over there for about 20,000 fans. And now that racing is less and less a part of the, the mix on the grounds, they, they could probably <laughs> accommodate something more permanent. So uh, 10 but miles off you, of campus. No, <laughs> that's well, great. Well, you, 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 you certainly would have it off campus, but you would never have a football stadium on campus to begin with. <laughs> Um, th I think the, the, the real threat is to Badger football and whether or not um, the, the statewide football program now at the college level uh, would be intimidated enough to uh, undermine support for a football program here. And I think that's a, that's a reality. Uh, I don't think. There's many who say that they would do it. The money simply would not be Not there. so fast. And <laughs> put your fake hot, uh, pan hey, I'm this a is pan real. This I'm is a real. panther. You're not a panther. <laughs> you think Madison would be afraid of UWM at a football team? Baloney. No. Uh, no. Uh, being no, no, a panther, no, no, no. I can see this. Uh, when I was a student there, mm. I wanted to do two things. One, uh -oh. go to class, and two, get out of there and go home. I'm not going to hang around or, or, or go to football games. They haven't had a football. You said return, go back to football. We haven't had football at UWM since, what, the late 50s, early 60s? Early 60s. It's a different, it's a it's different a, campus. It's a different, a different campus now. They said they got almost 6,000 resident students on that campus and that so don't go home anymore. And so put in the basketball ba Absolutely. In the basket, Absolutely. Uh, which is popular, does draw fans, does draw interest. Uh, It'd be a multi-use there, facility. There are too many negatives with football. Where would you play it and setting up temporary stands at State Fair? They, yeah. they do that for the pig races, okay? Uh, and 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 there's but I don't it think be done. I well, don't think there's any interest in using any public money to build a facility. I, for I agree. And you know what? UW, UWM has spent a lot of time and energy and money trying to build a fall sport already around soccer. Um, so you know, and I I I, I think Joel's absolutely right. You know, I'm put right. the money. <laughs> Ooh, okay, Kevin's right. Right. <laughs> um, put the money into an arena for basketball. It can become a multiple-use facility. Um, they they can find a place close to campus to put by it that doesn't require as much space as a football stadium. And you know what? You know, go Badgers. I think they, I, I just don't see that there's going to be enough support in this town for football. All right, let's switch gears for just a minute from football games to protest Panther. marches. Rick Horowitz isn't usually a taking it to the streets kind of guy, but <laughs> what he's been seeing these past six weeks or so he has made <laughs> has made him reconsider, especially when he sees how hard some of the other people are pushing back. Rick. Just because somebody yells acorn, that doesn't mean you're nuts. They yell acorn, some people do, and sometimes they yell mob, or socialists, or communists, or anti-Semites, or even <gasps> community organizers. They want you to ignore those people, to dismiss those people, those people they're yelling those things about, the Occupy Wall Street protesters in New York and everywhere else. The right-wing smoke machine is in quite the panic lately. The last thing they want to see is a bunch of ordinary people taking to the streets in bigger and bigger numbers, expressing their concerns about how the system works these days. How it works these days is really well for a few people, the well-positioned and the well-connected, and not at all for so many more. 
which you know in your gut, let alone in your wallet, is absolutely true. And truer now than it's been any time in recent memory. Meanwhile, you're worried that it's only going to get worse, that the folks who write the rules and the folks who keep the rule writers fat and happy, richly financed and tightly controlled, have stopped caring about people like you, have stopped even pretending to care about people like you. They want to tilt the playing field even further in their own favor. They want the lion's share of the reward and none of the risk, none of the accountability when things go wrong or when they break the rules to grab an even bigger share. It's not fair, and the protesters don't like it any more than you do. So they've taken to the streets to bear a kind of witness to that unfairness, to call out the rule breakers and the accountability shirkers, to demand a fair shake for themselves, for you. The right-wing smoke machine wants you to dismiss them. It needs you to dismiss them. So they trot out even more labels. The protesters are dirty, they're lazy, they're long-haired, they're unemployed, they're un-American, and they're divisive, divisive. By pointing out the unfairness and the inequality, the protesters are engaging in class warfare and pitting us against one another. Only if you think that the people who sound the fire alarm are just as guilty as the people who set the place on fire. Warning about the danger isn't causing the danger, and you know the difference. But watch the smoke machine try to make you forget. Thank you, Rick, and thank you so very much for watching. Enjoy the rest of your weekend.